and good morning to the Monday morning introduction to philosophy and theory lecture. My name is Julian. Hello also to everybody watching on YouTube. As per usual, let's introduce each other to ourselves. Instagram, hello, say hello to YouTube. YouTube, say hello to Instagram. This is going to be a 50 minute introductory lecture to Zizek's critique of political correctness, the psychoanalytic concept of the fetish and the symptom, the manner in which Marxism interprets the so-called false universal within contemporary capitalism, and a whole host of other ideas. That's the basic premise. Um, first of all, welcome. If you're joining for the very first time, this is a weekly introductory lecture series that I've been hosting for the past two years every Monday. The goal is basically to take difficult conceptual ideas within philosophy and theory and to break them down in a way that is accessible without dumbing them down too much, hopefully. These lectures can be enjoyed standalone, but they do form part of a longer series. I essentially host three-month lecture series. We're currently at the penultimate lecture of a series called Spurious Infinities, which is code for the Hegelian false universal. If you'd like to watch all the lectures, you can find them saved for free on YouTube, as well as on Instagram. Or if you'd like to download them as audio files, as well as join our community on Discord, where I host Q&A sessions after every lecture. Um, and you can get other learning materials like transcripts and my ebook. If you'd like to get all of that as a package, you can also purchase it on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Geneline and Julian. And yes, this is designed for beginners, but in a manner that should be equally enriching for experts, for people who are more familiar with these concepts. These, these lectures are, are unabashedly difficult. They're not dumbed down, but they are designed for beginners. That is my, that is my goal, at least. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to the patrons who keep this project alive and well. Um, it's an incredible privilege that I get to do this. And the fact that there is a group and a community of worldwide patrons who fund this open access educational project means the world to me. So thank you so much to our patrons. And if you'd like to become a patron, you know where to go. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Geneline and Julian. And now for my favorite part of the introduction, if you'd really like to do me a favor, I'd love to hear where you're joining me from. If you don't mind dropping a little comment, um, telling me where you're tuning in from, I'd be happy to give you a little shout out. That's actually what, what gives me the most joy. That is something that, as the cliche goes, money cannot buy. I see someone from Bavaria, <laughs> hello. Not too far from where I used to live, actually. Costa Rica, wow, hello. Vermont, Utrecht, Goeiemorgen Utrecht. Bolivia, Turkey, actually used to live in Istanbul, which is where I met Geneline. Uh, Colorado, Romania, um, India, Croatia, East Texas, Germany, <laughs> East Texas, that's, I love that, that's very specific. India, excellent. Uh, Boston, it is snowy here as well. Greetings to Boston, I'm a big Celtics fan, so go Celts. Uh, Germany, Bristol, Mexico, hello, San Diego, Berlin, hello, Berlin, wonderful place. I spent a month in Berlin this summer, it was great. Syria, welcome, that's incredible. Melbourne, love Melbourne, some of the best food in the world in Melbourne. This is becoming, I don't mean to turn this into a travel show. Uh, hello, Daniel from Argentina, I see you. Uh, London, London, where, where I lived for a very long time and used to work. Uh, California. I'm actually going to be in LA in a couple weeks, so that's coming up. Um, Philippines. I could do this for an hour. Syria again. It makes me very happy. Thank you guys so much for dropping a comment. That's wonderful. Lithuania, Pakistan. You guys are the best. Honestly, the fact that the fact that that we have a community of people who is. I mean, not all of you who get up early, but that some of you are getting up early to start your week in a philosophical fashion. It's amazing. So the fact that we have a global, global connection, naive as it sounds, really genuinely just inspires me. So thank you guys. Okay, so let's dive right in <clears throat> because this is going to be a juicy one. The, the presum 
the presumptive title for this session is The Fetish of Political Correctness and why political correctness functions as a fetish. Basically, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to explain Slavoj Žižek's critique of political correctness, which I should say is a critique and not a criticism. And the difference is that a criticism would be simply to normatively put it down, to say that it is bad, that it is some form of civilizational illness. A critique, on the other hand, tries to understand the mechanism from within, which is a fancy way of saying it tries to explain how political correctness emerges within the culture as such, which is something very different from, from the mere bashing of political correctness. It's also why Slavoj Žižek has found himself in a curious alignment with thinkers who are antithetical to his own practice, namely thinkers like Jordan Peterson, who are equally critical of political correctness, and yet in a manner that is completely different from Zizek's own stance. In fact, the critique of political correctness is something that runs throughout the leftist tradition, but I would argue has also been appropriated within a certain right-wing polemical context. And so what we're going to try to do today is we're going to try to restore the critique of political correctness back to a more, if you will, elevated discussion of the postmodern condition of life, capitalism, the idea of Lacanian psychoanalysis, and, and do it in a way that is hopefully enriching and stimulating to you, that will leave you with some, some I don't know, something that you can take home from this, essentially. Some, some knowledge, as it were. Okay, so let us begin. First of all, I want to start with a very basic distinction that's going to help us throughout the rest of this lecture, which is the psychoanalytic distinction between the symptom and the fetish. Now, the symptom and the fetish are already attached at the hip. You could even argue that the fetish is a, 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 a symptomatic disavowal, but we'll get back to that in a moment. Let's imagine a situation in which you've experienced loss, in which you've lost somebody. The symptom would be what happens if you try to repress this loss, if you try to ignore it, if you find something else that would, in a sense, allow you to cope without confronting the fact that you have lost the thing. And this can be something that works in devious ways. Think about how melancholy traditionally was symptomatic. What I mean by that is melancholy wasn't simply mourning the loss of someone. Melancholy was becoming a kind of frozen person, being paralyzed, falling in love with your own pain that the process of falling in love with your own pain so as not to lose the memory of the person thereby becomes symptomatic. It doesn't allow you to function as an individual, as a human being. And so the symptom is that which cannot be confronted. The symptom is that which is something that cannot be resolved, it cannot be faced directly. Hence also why it functions hand in hand with repression and the famous return of the repressed, whereby something eventually comes back to bite you. And when it comes back to bite you, this is usually known as symptomatic behavior. You are doing something, not because you're confronting the original problem, but because you've repressed some underlying content. This is also like key if you want to understand the Freudian slip. The idea of the Freudian slip, which is sort of commonly known, is that let's say a politician is standing at a lectern and he says something that appears to reveal his underlying intent that he wants to say, I love the public, but instead he, some, he says something like, I hate the public. And usually we think that the Freudian slip is the return of the repressed, right? He's trying to hide that he hates the public, and suddenly the truth comes out. And yet, that is precisely not what the Freudian slip is intended to mean. Within the logic of the Freudian slip, the utterance, the slip, is never the direct result of repression as such. It's always something new. It's always something that emerges as the result of repression itself. This may seem very similar, but it's a key difference. Think about it. If you say that the utterance, the Freudian slip, is something that emerges from having been held down, it's essentially like you put a mouse in a jar and the mouse escapes. However, the more radical conclusion of the Freudian slip is that what emerges out of the jar was never there in the first place. In other words, that by putting a lid on the jar, something emerged through the act of repression itself. Hence, we no longer have something primordial that is emerging, that has been repressed, that is coming out. Instead, we have something that emerges new, excessively, a slip that wasn't there before, 
because of the act of repression itself, repression which is required for all engagement with the symbolic, all forms of speech. And so this Freudian slip is never the reveal of an underlying truth, but instead it's the emergence of a new, symptomatic, excessive, which is what we call indivisible remainder, which is the excessive feature of repression as such. This is also, if you think about like the difference between the subconscious and the unconscious, is that the subconscious classically was portrayed as the idea of um, an iceberg floating in the water. That you see the peak of it, but underneath there's like this massive realm. That's, that under the water is the subconscious, and on the top we see the visible part, the conscious. And Freud's definition of the unconscious, the famous discovery of the unconscious, is precisely to posit that there is nothing under the water. That there is no underlying content that has to be repressed, but that it is the act of the repression that there is nothing to be repressed, which precisely leads to the excessive subjectivity of the unconscious. These are formal mechanisms that are quite important, but we can put them aside for the moment. Remember, we're talking about the difference between the symptom and the fetish. Now, whereas the symptom has to do with repression, the fetish is in fact something that allows you to cope but not by repressing it, but by being seemingly very direct about it, seemingly very realistic about it. I'll give you an example of this, how this functions actually as an analogy within, within modern postmodern culture. One of the primary coping mechanisms or fetishes of privilege today is precisely acknowledging your own privilege. Everybody has seen this before, right? How when privileged people talk about their own privilege, it becomes a form of privilege. This is where the conservative critique is actually totally misplaced, which is to say that it is simply a form of virtue signaling, that you don't feel embarrassed about your wealth, but you're pretending to feel embarrassed about your wealth so that other people won't judge you, virtue signaling. But it's exactly the other way around. It's that the enjoyment, what, what Lacan would have called the surplus enjoyment, lies precisely within <clears throat> acknowledging your own privilege within the enjoyment of saying, I know I'm privileged, I know I don't deserve what I have, I know that I have an unfair advantage above other people, that they're in the ultimate privilege isn't simply having wealth, the ultimate privilege is being able to apologize for your privilege. This is the postmodern irony in which the fetish of privilege is thereby precisely to profess your own privilege apropos other people, to say that, yes, you know that you are an undeserving subject because you've had generational wealth that provided you with an advantage, and so on and so forth. The key again here is that the conservative critique of virtue signaling would imply that it is simply feigned, that you are feigning to apologize for your privilege to appeal to people who are less privileged. Whereas the more properly leftist approach is to say that it's precisely within the full embrace of the surplus enjoyment, the excessive enjoyment, which is thereby not simply the enjoyment of having privilege, but also the enjoyment of being able to disavow your privilege, that we thereby have the fetish. There's an old Zizek joke that has the same idea, where three people uh, are brought to the king. The king comes to town, and we have a priest who arrives, we have a wealthy merchant who arrives, and we have a poor man, and they all have an audience with the king. And at this point, the priest bows down in front of the king and says, oh, mighty king, before you, I am nothing. And then the wealthy man bows down and says, oh, mighty king, before you, I am nothing. And then the, the poor man bows down and says, oh, mighty king, before you, I am nothing. At this point, the priest and the wealthy man jump up in anger, grab the poor man by the, by the scruff of his neck and say, who do you think you are to claim that you are nothing? Can't you see that we are more nothing than you? Here we have the fetish of apologizing for your own privilege. The privilege of going to the king and saying, I am truly nothing in front of you. What Lacan would have called surplus enjoyment. Now, what's key about this, what I mentioned before, is that there is an element of postmodernism here, which is that in order to live in a world in which we have disavowed the idea of belief, belief in a higher order of meaning, belief in a higher truth, belief in God, in order to live in this world in which everything thereby becomes a spurious sequence, 
of contingent events and meanings. In other words, the commonplace idea that you are simply a small, living, finite being on this ever-expanding universe. That in order to survive this life as we know it, what Adorno called damaged life, that we require some fetish. We have to hold on to some fetish in allow, to allow us to cope. This is actually where Jeneline, my wife, had a wonderful idea the other day that I thought was so good that I had to mention here, which is that she said, isn't it funny how when you go into movies, we're always asked to suspend our disbelief, right? You go into a movie like Avatar and for about three hours, you have to suspend your disbelief and suspend your bladder as you try not to go to the bathroom. You have to suspend your disbelief when it comes to the engagement with all the media around you. And yet, fundamentally, what is asked within our life is that we suspend our belief. That the suspension of disbelief that we practice within the cinema, within the theater, within reading, is mirrored increasingly by the suspension of belief as such. The suspension of belief in a higher ideal. For some people, the suspension of belief in God or what Lacan would have called the big other. Although we'll get to the big other in a moment because you can see how the big other functions as a fetish, but we'll get there. The suspension in the belief that our life serves some higher purpose, that the quote unquote realist attitude towards life thereby begets a kind of cynicism by which we see ourselves as being simply these fleeting temporal beings who are slowly dying in advance, as it were. And here we have something that Zizek already pointed out, which he said that one of the key inversions that takes place within a modern and postmodern society is that it used to be that everybody, that everybody believed in public, right? You'd go to church, you'd be there as, as, as participating in the faith, but that in private, you were allowed to have all your doubts, that you could go home after church and say, well, I don't believe in any of that crap. Whereas today, it's almost the exact opposite, that today, not believing, and not being a person of faith is the norm, that the secular society is the modern society. But as soon as you go home, everybody has lots of personal beliefs, superstitions, astrology, westernized versions of Buddhism, meditation, etc. that thereby belief has been transposed onto a kind of individual practice, an individual practice that of course allows you to cope better with life, alienated life, within what is known as late-stage capitalism. Here we can see how belief thereby functions contemporarily as a fetish. And what's so interesting is that one of Marx's classical ideas, which you're probably familiar with, was the idea of calling religion the opium of the people. And yet, if you read that passage about the opium of the people, Marx isn't simply condemning them. Marx doesn't take the sort of um, enlightened, antagonistic, atheist attitude that we see today from figures like Richard Dawkins, who simply condemn people of the faith as being some kind of irrational fools. Instead, what Marx argues is that under the conditions of the society in which he lives in, religion is a necessary feature of that life. Not a coping mechanism, but a necessary feature of that life. What Lacan or Freud would later call a fetish something that you have to believe in, in a world that is becoming increasingly abstracted and, 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 and reified. Marx's point, therefore, is not to demystify religion and to make people wake up to the truth that God is dead, but instead, precisely, to create the world in which religion will no longer be necessary in which religion will thereby assume its proper true form as collective emancipation as a form of higher living, which for Marx, of course, is equated with communism. And here we come to the kernel that can be very, I think, very frustrating for a lot of leftists and, and controversial, which is that in this precise sense, Marx is not positing that communism is antithetical to religion, but that religion is a transitory stage within the unfolding of a higher form of being. And that the enlightenment stance, the atheist stance towards religion is precisely a form of disavowal of this unfolding of what Marx believes thereby to be deterministic. And so religion doesn't present itself as the folly of those who are impressed by the idea of a spaghetti monster in the sky. Religion instead is the necessary symptomatic feature of a society trying to find meaning within an increasingly alienated world. 
Now, this isn't to say that your average Westboro Baptist church isn't any way communist or leftist. If anything, contemporary evangelicism that tends to insist on a radical turn away from the world is thereby precisely, again, a form of fetish, a coping mechanism that allows people to function perfectly well in their own alienated existence because they believe that they found some higher cause or being. Here we come back to the idea of the big other. One of Lacan's arguments about the big other, one of the conclusions that we can draw from it, is that as soon as the faith within modern society thereby becomes a cope, that faith has become fetishistic. And this word that we have for fetishistic faith, forgive the alliteration, is thereby the big other. Whether it's the big other of the insistence on, um, for example, uh, finance capital capitalists who have the idea of a number that they're chasing, or the fact the, the libertarian idea that the market regulates itself, which is a quasi-mystical idea. The idea of karma, that when you're standing in front of a street light, that if you um, that 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 if the light turns green immediately, that you are having a good day, or that if you help somebody, something good will happen to you. The manner in which we mystify alienated life according to some transcendental means that we cannot properly conceive of is thereby the big other. In other words, fetishistic towards modern life. What this means, to go back to something that I said at the beginning, is that the fetish is in a sense symptomatic. That the fetish is symptomatic of the death of God, the death of a certain belief, the death of a certain subjective investive stance towards reality as such. And so what's really key here for Lacan is that the big other isn't simply saying, oh, the big other is God, the big other is, is not there, is fake. For Lacan, the big other is there because of its absence, if you will. In this sense, the belief in the idea of some higher structuring symbolic order is thereby a necessity to tie in a kind of master signifier, if you will, of the contingent sequences of, 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 of actions that have thereby been deprived of their meaning. Now, one contemporary version of this that you'll probably recognize is the increased fascination uh, with Western Buddhism. Uh, and by Western Buddhism, I tend to mean this sort of watered down uh, Southern California, or if you will, like Silicon Valley emphasis on a certain type of Western Buddhism, which emphasizes being in the moment and um, uh, meditation practices, well-being, etc. None of these things are bad in and of themselves, and you could in fact argue that there are certain overlaps within the Buddhist take on desire and the Lacanian theory of desire, although I would argue also that there are more differences than similarities, but that's for another time. Fundamentally, a lot of this Western Buddhism functions as a fetish because it works as a cope. It works as a way for you to function increasingly well within an increasingly alienated life. And the core and the, the, the most important thing to emphasize here is that it works. Just because it works doesn't mean that it isn't fetishistic. This is similar to an, a take that Lacan has. Lacan says that if there is a man who is suspicious of his wife, that she's cheating on him, that strictly speaking, it doesn't matter whether or not she is in fact cheating on him that if the man discovers that his wife is cheating on him, that his suspicion was nevertheless pathological. In other words, the suspicion of his wife cheating on him isn't, isn't any less pathological if it turns out that it is true. Something similar happens within the fetish of Buddhism as such, which is that, or Western Buddhism, I should say, which is that it's precisely because it is effective that it is pathological, because it works because it allows you to be a better, happier, more functioning, thriving worker and participant within modern life and what leftists refer to as late stage capitalism. If it didn't work, it wouldn't, in a sense, allow itself to be that. And so here again, we have the symptom and we have the fetish. The symptom within modern life is the increased alienation that we experience, the manner in which we become detached from the idea of some form of higher purpose or meaning or investment. And we increasingly see our lives as being a kind of resource that has to be expended in a way that is logically uh, sustainable within the incentive structures of capitalism. Within this symptomatic experience of modern subjectivity or postmodern subjectivity, 
the fetish is symptomatic of that life. In other words, the fetish is the manner in which we cope with it. I've mentioned this before, but there's like a classic psychoanalytic example of this where a man has a hamster. So basically it works like this. A man loses his wife, wife passes away. Apologies if you've heard this one before. A man loses his wife, she passes away. And the man becomes very attached to a hamster. And the hamster becomes his everything. He's constantly taking care of it, he's talking to it, etc. And he seems pretty much okay. Like he's realistic about the fact that his wife has died, he's functioning in his job, he's moving forward in life until the hamster dies. At this point, the man has a complete psychotic breakdown. The argument thereby is that the hamster is a fetish, that his attachment to the hamster is thereby not something that has any originating value in the hamster, but is strictly speaking overdetermined by the loss of the wife. In other words, that he doesn't have to confront the unconfrontable, which is the pain of losing his wife, by means of supplementing it with the hamster. And thereby, the symptomatic disavowal of his pain is infused into his love for the hamster and his emphasis on the care that he gives to the hamster. Again, the love that he experiences for the hamster is in this concrete sense real. It is a genuine affection that he has for the hamster in as much as the pain that he experiences is thereby magnified when the hamster is lost. Here you can see the interrelationship between the fetish and the symptom the symptomatic disavowal that infuses the fetish with the perceived concrete properties. Now, the reason that I'm introducing all of this is that we're working towards Zizek's critique of political correctness. And the manner in which Zizek conceives of the critique of political correctness is pretty straightforward and yet has multiple layers of theory behind it. His basic stance is that political correctness is a fetish within postmodern life. So let's break that down for a moment. Essentially what Zizek is arguing is that the manner in which he conceives of political correctness is that it is trying to avoid hurting people. The way in which he puts it is that the, the trying to not cause or give offense to others becomes a key moral imperative within postmodern life. The word that is key for Zizek here is harassment. And harassment can be a little bit deceptive because we think of harassment in legal terms. But what Zizek means is that fundamentally to exist among other people is, as Sartre put it, a kind of hell. That to exist amongst others is innately a form of harassment. That we bother them in as much as they bother us. A surprising person who actually mirrored this idea is uh, Hayao Miyazaki, the animator and director of these mini studio Ghibli, Ghibli movies who in an interview said that for him fundamentally, people harass each other, that they are a burden on each other, that if somebody is in his presence, he is easily annoyed by them and he will easily annoy them. Now that seem like, might seem like a terribly misanthropic take on life, certainly not something that we see reflected in his films, and yet it's actually not supposed to be mean-spirited. Essentially, it's a very quote-unquote realist stance on the fact that the other disturbs us. The other disturbs us in our experience of unity, of seeing the world in a way that is determined by our own subjective stance. This can be delightful. If you read a book, famously, you're essentially allowing yourself to see the world through somebody else's viewpoint. And I'll get back to in a moment why this is also easily bastardized into the contemporary liberal multiculturalism of multiple points of view, but we'll get there. And so Zizek's idea is that one of the foundational principles, and this isn't just his idea, I mean, this is something we see within a lot of other theorists, that one of the foundational principles of socio-symbolic life is the experience of the other as disruptive, as disruptive to our core sense of being. And that thereby, within the postmodern society, everything is done to avoid this harassment or this disruption. If you will, this is actually a foundational feature that Marx already points out within industrialization and the emergence of capitalism, which is that the introduction of money and the exchange of, of, uh, of monetary value is a way of keeping people away. That the whole point of money is that it is both 
an emancipatory principle. After all, everybody can pay for something with money. You don't have to be a king or a serf. It doesn't matter. As long as you show up with a dollar bill, you can buy something that is the equivalent of a dollar bill. However, the symptomatic effect of this is also that we don't need to know each other. That if you go to a coffee shop and you buy something like a $5 cup of coffee and the barista says to you something like, so how's your day? He's not really expecting you to then say, well, here's how my day was. Here's everything I've done. I cried over the loss of my hamster because my wife died, etc." Now, the crucial thing here is that this is not a kind of a vulgar liberal leftist stance that we need to go back to authentic communication and we need to be there for each other's feelings and that we really need to like, when we ask somebody how we're doing, we're actually asking them how they're doing. Instead, this, this abstraction, this disavowal that takes place, namely the politesse or what Hegel already called Zittlichkeit, the participation in a kind of theatrics of society, how are you means I don't really want to know how you are, is necessary and constitutive of the safety of the individual as such. That it is thereby precisely the, the, the psychotic who truly and naively assumes that somebody is asking how they're doing when they ask how they're doing. Now, it's key to note here, again, this is not cynical. We're putting in place the building blocks for Zizek's critique of political correctness. One of them was that within postmodern life, we try to avoid harassment, which is a theoretical way of saying that we try to avoid encounters with the other that might be, in a sense, threatening to our own subjective self. One of the ways in which this emerges or originates within capitalism as such and the exchange of money, which, let's say, money existed before the existence of capitalism. Capitalism is the process by which the valuation that emerges through the exchange of goods becomes increasingly abstracted from the physical reality of said goods, both their production and their exchange. However, when you give somebody a dollar bill, this is an emancipatory gesture. I could give it to you, a king could give it to you, anybody could give it. It, it makes you more equal, but thereby it also precisely abstracts from your identity. And what emerges thereby is the insistence on a kind of theatrics of identitarian interactions through lifestyle. So now you can use your money to buy a hat that will signify to the other your political leanings or a card or a bumper sticker. And so what is thereby being desublimated within financial exchange, which is the identitarian expression, which is a good thing, after all, this is liberating, has to be supplemented through fetishistic attachment to lifestyle objects that will then fill in this gap. In other words, the symptomatic process of alienation is thereby not simply the process of, oh, we've become sad in capitalism. It's a much more formal sequence, which is the liberating feature of the desublimation of identity within the exchange of value, which then has to be supplemented through fetishistic attachment to the fetish object, which thereby fills in the gap that is emerges merged within the identification that is being desublimated. And this is super, I know it's hard, but it's super important because one of the key things that you have to understand within Marxism is that when Marx complains about bourgeois ideology, capitalism, the commodity, etc., he has a very formal complaint. And what I mean by a formal complaint is that Marx essentially argues that the power structure, if you will, the hierarchy of the serf and the lord which was the pre-industrial, pre-capitalist power structure, right? We had the innate ruler and then the person who worked the land. That this power structure, which was supposed to have been lost or gotten rid of within capitalism, the free exchange of goods, has yet persisted. That nevertheless, it is still there. That the fundamental power imbalance between the bondsman, the serf, and the lord has been transposed into capitalist relations, but that it is now disavowed. And the manner in which it is disavowed is what is called ideology. Ideology is what thereby infuses a fetishistic attachment, if you will, a cope, onto the idea of a true universal participation within capitalism, 
that disavows or obfuscates the maintained imbalance, or in other words, that the lord and the bondsman relationship has simply been transposed into capitalism, but is now disavowed. Hence also Zizek's argument that there is a kind of quote-unquote authenticity to authoritarianism, which is that in an authoritarian system, at least you know that you are being oppressed. You know exactly who to hate. Whereas within a more liberal technocratic society, oppression has been, ex, um, has been outsourced to yourself. You are now asked to be your own oppressor. You are asked to discipline yourself. You are asked to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And that if you somehow fail to do so, well, then it is simply your own fault that you haven't sufficiently invested yourself or optimized yourself within the incentive structure of capitalist participation. That this is thereby an ideological move from the quote unquote authentic visible constraints of an authoritarian society towards the invisible constraints of a society that remains authoritarian in nature, but that has now disavowed this content from within and supplements it through fetishistic attachment to self-optimization, to watching the Kardashians and so on and so forth. I'm not against the Kardashians. I actually think it's a very interesting show. Now, there's a couple of things that we have to tie in here because we're still talking about political correctness. So Zizek's argument thereby is that political correctness is supposed to protect the individual from harassment, which is code for an encounter with the other. Now, one of the manners in which this is found today, as I put in the beginning of the lecture, is, for example, the humble bragging that is implicit within confessing to your own privilege. But more specifically, the rhetoric of political correctness tends to emphasize something which appears to be good, namely the inclusivity, the inclusivity of universal rights. In other words, that people are not supposed to be offended. And there's two levels here that I want to point out. One, well, no, maybe as a, as a parenthesis, it's good not to offend people, right? The contrarian who believes that he is some kind of sage simply because he says that which is indefensible is simply an idiot. The person who thinks that he is so wise is another version of the fool. You could even argue, to go back to the previous point, that within a society in which the master-slave relation has been ideologically disavowed, that it is precisely that society that creates multiple meta-narratives about conspiratorial others, the CIA, anti-Semitism, uh, corrupt, shady organizations, etc., etc., that allow you to thereby transpose your criticism or critique as an emancipated subject onto a, a non-existent imaginary other, which Lacan thereby would call the big other. In this sense, antisemitism functions as a form of the big other. That antisemitism emerges precisely within an industrial society because it posits the idea of a structuring, ordering feature of the overarching master signifier of the capital J Jew. This is, of course, one of the immense fallacies of reactionary critiques that often include antisemitism, which is the insistence on order, and that order has been corrupted by precisely placing a false order on the idea of a universal uh, scapegoated subject. But that's a tangent. My point here, actually, let me reference a TikTok video. I saw a beautiful TikTok video. I liked it so much. That makes much better than any Marxist leftist could the point about the false universal within human rights as such. And it's, uh, I believe it's <clears throat> three women, might be, I don't remember if it's three women, could also be, could also be a man, I'm not sure, um, are sitting at a table and the TikTok starts by saying not to be political, which is a great hook, followed by, I hope that this year I can go to the club. Not to be political, but I hope that my life matters. Not to be political, but I want to be the universal subject of capitalism. The, the beautiful irony of this TikTok video, which I'll try to find and post to the Discord, is that it thereby posits as, if you will, an act of resistance, the insistence on the false universal. Now, let me break that down. One of the old school, classic Marxist takes 
is to say what appears to you as a true universal within society is in fact a false universal. For example, property rights, one of the great emancipatory ideals of capitalist societies, everyone can own property. And yet the classic leftist move is to point out that everyone, uh, that some are more equal than others, that not everybody can have access to credit and not everybody can thereby own a home, etc., etc. And so what happens within this form of criticism is simply a demystifying process by which you take what appears to be a universal structuring condition of society and you point out that it is not so. For example, what appear as the universal privileges of mankind within modern society is often by, by leftists pointed out as being, in fact, the reified rights of white cisgen males. Now, there's a limitation to this argument, which is that it easily leads us to a kind of cynicism, which is the cynicism that, you know, everything is sort of rigged and preordained and that you are somehow the victim, etc. But the gesture within Marxism is a much more theoretical one, which is a holdover from Hegel, if you will, which is that there is no fully fledged true universal, that all universals are false. And thereby, if all universals are false, namely that they are masking a imbalance within their own system, for example, the emphasis on the universal um, uh, right to own property, thereby masks the fact that not everyone has access to own property, right? That this imbalance that is thereby pregnant within every universal, in other words, every true universal is thereby innately false, that this nodal point is the point of resistance, the point of hegemony. That it's precisely saying that the manner in which to combat this isn't simply to point it out, but thereby from and within that very inconsistency to build an equally false universal that will thereby be scaled towards those people who have been underrepresented within the aforementioned false universal. This is a key, th key thing, which is that all universality for Marxism is false. And Communism is simply code for a universal that doesn't succumb into falsity. It's the ideal, if you will, the almost transcendental positing of a universal that doesn't succumb to its own disavowal. A universal that is not symptomatic, that is not supplemented through fetish, if you will. But we can engage with that for another time. <clears throat> and so the insistence on political correctness follows a standard liberal logic within postmodern society, which is the positing of certain false universals. For example, the classic one from about 15, 20 years ago was the idea of multiculturalism. The idea that we needed to create a society in which we emphasized the strong points of every culture and we tried to eliminate the things that we didn't find so agreeable. The standard Marxist approach is simply to say, who gets to determine what is agreeable and what is not agreeable? This is also the standard critique of tolerance that you find, for example, within Derrida. That tolerance implies the position of power. Namely, you get to tolerate someone, which already implies that they are thereby subordinate to your tolerance, that they have to perhaps even be grateful to be tolerated by you. But secondly, it also implies that you frame as neutral the normative evaluation required to determine what is to be tolerated and what is not to be tolerated. This process thereby, which again, I would argue is part and parcel to political correctness, certainly that is Zizek's argument, is thereby a postmodern fetish within capitalist society. The insistence on a false universal frame of equality of multicultural appreciation on the idea that everybody has a good side on the redemption of the villain within the ordering or within the signifying structure this insistence, this raising up, is thereby precisely a fetish that is particular to the disavowed remaining inequality that persists within capitalism as such. Now, there's a couple of elements that I want to emphasize here because I need to wrap it up and there's so much more to say. I really wanted to talk about ChatGPT, but we may have to do that 
in the Discord. This is the second week where I wanted to talk about the chatbots and AI, but it's not going to fit. So we're going to have to do that in the Discord, which is available to all patrons for, I think it's like $5. This is like my little ad break here. Um, and thank you to the patrons who allow me to keep doing this for free on the internet. You guys rock. Um, okay, so I want to want to want to end here, which is that Zizek's argument. I'm going to summarize it as clearly as I can. Zizek's critique thereby is that political correctness is a fetishistic attachment to the idea of universality that is conditioned by a postmodern stance towards subjectivity within capitalism. Now, as per usual with philosophy, the most simplified definition actually makes it a lot harder. So we can break that down a little bit. For Zizek, not giving offense, not harassing the other, thereby creating a world in which everybody individually can be more effective in their participation within society, which ought to be an emancipatory ideal, becomes subjugated within the logic of postmodern society and capitalism to refusing to critique the structural inequalities that remain persistently invisible and that allow us to participate within the world in a frictionless manner. And political correctness here has to be taken even at a Bajuan level, by which I mean Alain Bajua argues that even dating culture today fundamentally serves to regulate the romantic encounter, to take away the minimal element of harassment within dating as such. We're not speaking here of sexual violence. We're speaking here of the momentary transgression that occurs within any romantic encounter, the moment in which you take the leap of faith and you ask somebody out, or you, or you give them a kiss, or you ask them into your apartment. That this danger that is thereby implicit within dating which of course is magnified in love. Nothing can mess you up more as a optimized worker than falling in love and suddenly seeing the world in a totally different way and seeing your priorities in a different way, as attested to by many clips I've seen on the internet that seem to suggest that falling in love is something that can easily put you off your goals, etc. That what we do within our society thereby is we try to neuter the revolutionary potential of this transgression, of the transgression implicit within falling in love or the transgression implicit within the romantic encounter as such. We try to optimize it and regulate it and make it suitable to our life so that we can work three jobs at once and then go, go to a date where we've already made a reservation and we've ordered in advance what we'd like to have on the menu that we can avoid and optimize as much as possible anything that might go wrong. And the point here is that it is not a form of punching down. It's not saying that these things are bad. Remember, I started by saying that the fetish is a fetish because it works. It works all too well, and yet thereby is precisely pathological. Just because it works doesn't make it not pathological. And that thereby the insistence on an increasingly regulated biopolitical attachment towards the neutralization of the possibility of pain and harm and psychological damage and, and the, the emphasis on trigger warnings, etc., the creation of so-called safe spaces, is not the creation of a safe space for you. It's the creation of a safe space for capitalism, in which the fundamental incentive structures of life are presented you to you, are presented to you as untraversable, as something which cannot even be thought as being possibly different. This is Jameson's famous and much quoted maxim that it's become easier for us to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. That we equate alienated life with life as such. And that this is precisely sold to us as the means by which we are happier and more enlightened and more effective and taking better care of ourselves. Zizek's fundamental argument thereby is that Political correctness is a fetish that is symptomatic towards alienated life within late-stage capitalism. And his argument thereby fundamentally doesn't align with the conservative criticism of political correctness as virtue signaling. The idea that it is simply about pretending or feigning to not hurt others or policing speech 
or not being allowed to say what you think because you have to cushion the blows or that you, that you can't use the proper pronouns because this is taking away your fundamental liberty. That, that is completely antithetical to Zizek's argument. Zizek's argument isn't that political correctness is what polices your freedom. Zizek's argument is that political correctness is what provides you with the false sense of freedom with an increasingly alienated life. They're fundamentally diametrically opposed viewpoints. Zizek doesn't argue that there's an a priori freedom that you have as subject that has to be protected against the regulating forces of groupthink and, and, and what Althusser might have called the police, police being general for everything that tries to control you. Political correctness, thereby for Zizek, is not the emphasis on how you are robbed of the freedom to articulate yourself. Instead, for Zizek, political correctness is the fundamental feature by which we try to rob articulation and exchange and interaction of its key constitutive feature of resistance, which is the encounter with the other. And this isn't simply, oh, we should have two points of view and we should have panels on the BBC that have a Nazi and a pacifist debating, which, of course, would be precisely the opposite of what Zizek is arguing. Zizek is part of a philosophical lineage that argues that philosophy should never engage itself in opinion. This might strike you as surprising because Zizek is a very opinionated person. And what he's referring to is that the, again, false universal of enlightened consensual discussion by which everybody contributes a point of view. A philanthropist sits at the same panel with a venture capitalist and a biologist and a quantum physicist and that together we have this melting pot of of enlightened ideals where everybody contributes is precisely ideologically suspicious that this form of exchange this quote unquote neutral exchange of ideas essentially turns everything into a process that moves towards consensus and consensus within the leftist tradition is always code for a temporary hegemonic position that is presenting or masking as being universal. In other words, a false universal. And that thereby the task and the project of philosophy, something that Zizek takes, for example, from Alain Badieu, is precisely the drawing of distinctions, the drawing of lines, saying the manner in which we conceive of something is fundamentally different. The word freedom means something different to you than it means to me. And thereby the exchange of ideas is not about opinion. It's not about contributing towards the general pool of human thought. Instead, it's precisely about saying this is where we fundamentally completely disagree because the manner in which we conceptualize of key terminology is so opposed to each other that we cannot move towards agreement without compromising our principles. Zizek thereby argues, again, taking this from Alain Badieu, that within postmodern life, within the suspension of belief that is necessary to live in a contemporary world, we thereby supplement fetishistically this lack of belief through the belief in a universal, enlightened state in which everyone contributes equally in which your thoughts can all melt together into a higher ideal. That the philanthropist can bring his business acumen to government, that the politician can bring his diplomatic skills to Facebook, and that the rotating door politics and uh, policies in which nobody has any principles save for the idea that the skills that they have acquired can help other people in their own endeavors, thereby belies the absence of any ordering, structuring principle of belief as such, that nobody knows where they stand. In fact, that nobody needs to stand anywhere because it is inconvenient to have principles. Thereby, Badjo's argument is that the principle of modern life is that it is without principle, that everyone is open-minded. And the task of philosophy is thereby precisely to draw lines and distinctions to clearly delineate what something is and what something is not, which is, of course, not how one makes friends, and it is certainly not politically correct. Hence also why Zizek says that one of the key attributes of friendship and mutual respect is precisely that you are very clear about your disagreements, that to assuage the other by feigning to agree with them when fundamentally you could not be more opposed to them is thereby an act of disrespect, disrespect which we associate with politesse or politeness. 
as you will have experienced when you engage in polite conversation. You're constantly making it sound like you agree with them, even if you fundamentally might not. This is how we could have a leftist and a reactionary right-wing person at the same dinner table seemingly agreeing about the hidden forces underlying society, for example. Zizek's argument, thereby, is that political correctness, as I said before, is symptomatic of a society that is looking for a false universal that has to be raised or elevated to the principle of universality as such. That political correctness is thereby a fetish, something that we hold on to within postmodern life. That the principle of non-harassment, the principle of non-antagonism, the principle of not offending the other, thereby belies a kind of desubjectivized speech, a kind of desubjectivized universal principle of speech that is, that is its, its exact opposite, that is a principle of no principles. And that, of course, it masks itself in the ideology of kindness and compassion. Think about how corporations or basketball teams can argue that their core values, such as the Golden State Warriors, that their core value is joy and compassion. Whereas everybody knows that joy and compassion is not what will get you to the finals. In the exact same manner that a philanthropist can say that the reason they get up in the morning is to give to other people, that they realize the Buddhist principle of giving is enriching, when it is precisely philanthropist capitalists who take from everybody until everybody has been sucked completely dry. That this unity of opposites, to make a slightly vulgar Hegelian twist on this, is that thereby exploitation comes in the manner of giving. That, 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 that enslavement comes by means of being told that you are free. That happiness is now suddenly the fact that you have no obligations. That the manner in which we conceive of life becomes masked by its opposite. And thereby we are all looking for a fetish, a fetish that allows us to cope within this alienated life. And Zizek simply argues that the fetish of, post uh, the fetish of political correctness is thereby the fetish that is purely, beautifully, perfectly tailored to the symptom of late stage capitalism, which is the symptom of alienated life within postmodern existence. That is Zizek's critique of political correctness. That's it. That is, the, that is the argument, as much as I can try to put it in an hour. Hopefully you'll have learned a couple of things along the way about the symptom and the fetish, about so many other things that we've discussed. Um, if you like these lectures, you're always invited to tune in every Monday, 8 to 9 a.m. USA PT. Or if you'd like to support these classes, which are entirely patron funded, and open access for free for anybody on the internet. It's just me in my pajamas Monday morning, tr trying my best to hopefully share these ideas with you. If you'd like to support these classes financially, please do consider becoming a patron. The Discord is very fun, I've been told, and I also hold, host a Q&A, which is an hour-long discussion where I get to talk about all the things that I haven't talked about and take your questions. I host that after this lecture, which I also post as a podcast for patrons. So you are cordially invited to join our Patreon community at www.patreon.com forward slash Gentleline and Julian. Thank you guys again so much. I'm so happy that you're here. I truly, truly value your time and your attention. And most of all, I hope that this has been valuable to you. Thank you guys so much. And I will see those of you who are patrons in about 10 minutes on the Discord. Talk to you soon.